Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our media briefing titled Global South Voices, Listening to the Impacted Community and People Leading Solutions. My name is Marissa Naidu. I am the Africa Plastics Campaigner for Gaia and Break Free from Plastic, based in Durban, South Africa, and I will be moderating the event for today. At this time, I would like to mention that this is a hybrid event, both in person and at our Zero Waste House in Paris and online. For our participants via Zoom, please note that we have interpretation in multiple languages, so please select the one that best um, suits your needs. For media personnel that are with us in person, a Zoom link for interpretation can also be made available to you. Okay, so I would like to kick off um, today's event by introducing our exciting panelists of speakers um, who are Rafael Ferreira from the Zero Waste Alliance for Brazil, Larissa de Ober from the Axion Elogica, Mexico, um, Indomati from the International Alliance of Waste Pickers and the Alliance of Indian Waste Pickers. We also have John Treya from the International Alliance of Waste Pickers and the Kenyan National Alliance of Waste Pickers. And Arpita Bahat from um, Gaia, Africa, uh, sorry, Gaia, Asia Pacific, as well as Alejandra Para from Gaia. Thank you. Okay, so we will um, first start with um, Rafael, uh, who will talk us through false solutions and EPR. Over to you, Rafael. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here to be talking about false solutions. My name is Rafael Eudes Ferreira. Uh, I am from the Zero Waste Alliance in Brazil. And um, um, uh, I'll be talking about false solutions and what are, we are experiencing in Brazil and how it's related to the plastics treaty. Um, so, talking about false solutions, we've been seeing the industry of plastics and petrochemical promote certain solutions that might increase the bad impacts in the environment and don't solve the plastic problem. So uh, when you think about Brazil, we've been seeing uh, uh, different experiences with the promotion of incineration, pyrolysis, chemical recycling, co-processing, and all of these processes have been uh, uh, installed in Brazil for the last past few years with the last government. And we've been trying to discuss about this because we know that those solutions that are false solutions, they might increase uh, the impacts of uh, the, the, the plastic that being produced. So the plastic basic is being burned in, in those uh, facilities. And when you burn plastic, you produce a lot of gases that are polluting our environments. Uh, and also we have, um, uh, we need a really, really, really uh, big structure to treat all of those gas produced, produced, produced during this process. And if we had a really uh, good uh, gas treatment, at the end, we have CO2 emissions. And you already know that we need to have to reduce our CO2 emissions. And we've been seeing from different examples around the world of those gas treatment that not, does not work properly. So you see the local communities and marginalized communities being impacted uh, uh, the major uh, gas uh, pollutants that we produce including this uh, solution. So in Brazil, we have an example of an incineration uh, that being installed last year in Sao Paulo and the local community have been trying to uh, cap this production of uh, incineration of plastics. Uh, it's been really hard. They are really arguing with the government because uh, all of the licensing process for this incineration does not consider all of the bad impacts in the environment. And all of this being promoted by those organizations that are close to this uh, installation, um, but they, are, they keep pushing this as a solution. Here in the plastic treaty, we have a document from UNEP that says that we don't need to be really focusing on incineration as a solution. And we hope to see the other countries um, voting for uh, uh, incineration as not a solution for this plastic problem. And this is what we expect as a, as a movement. 
And also um, we have an example in Brazil uh, of EPR schemes. So basically in Brazil, now we don't have exactly an EPR scheme, but uh, most of uh, plastic neutrality that they call as a, a PR system. That basically APR means extended producer responsibility. And we've been seeing in Brazil this plastic neutrality as a solution from the FMCG companies. And, and basically those solutions, they do not do not solve the plastic problem. Basically, those companies they pay uh, a small amount of money to uh, waste pickers and other uh, companies that work at the waste sector. But at the end of all of the system, uh, they do not reduce the amount of plastic that they've been produce, producing. So it does not have to solve the problem. Uh, we really need to focus on the reduction of the production of plastics. Um, and this is an important aspect uh, for us in Brazil as organizations that fight uh, against the plastic pollution. And also here um, in Paris, during the INC2, uh, we really expect that we have a, a major part of the process of the this zero draft that we are going to see in the plastic theory that takes in consideration the reduction of production of plastics. That all solutions need to be plucked out of the plastic security. And now I'm going to hand it over to our next speaker, Larissa, who will provide us um, some insight and perhaps the same thing in the film itself and the film itself. Thank you, Marisa. Well, I, uh, I'm going to speak in Spanish. <laughs> um, somos un, un grupo we are a group of Mexican organizations which belong to Gaia. We have been tracking this phenomenon that has been called waste colonialism. This is a phenomenon that we are interested to in having an approach to this phenomenon in this treaty at the regional level. Actually, on the Gaia web page, you can find the results of a regional research about the quantity of plastic waste which are being exported from developed countries towards our region. You can find this report on the Gaia web page. And the results quickly evidenced that Mexico was the first place that received plastic waste from the developed countries, especially the United States. Next comes Ecuador, and El Salvador ranks third. This is why we are very interested in including this topic on the agenda of the treaty. To give you some more results that we found in Mexico with this group of organizations, which are part of a collective called Malditos Plásticos, and we found that as of 2018 up to 2021, the exports to our country increased by 121%. 90% comes from the US. This means that the Global North companies and countries are sending their plastic waste with the argument that it is going to be recycled in other countries which do not have the capacity to recycle them. And most of them are being sent to cement kilns to be used as fuel. From our point of view, this is a false solution, a violation of human rights of those people who live in these territories which are collapsed. If you want to learn more about what's happening in Mexico, a few months ago, we presented an interactive tool with maps that you can download, and it contains all the information. You can download it from mexicotoxico.org, and you can see it there. 
there are also case studies in Mexico that you can see on that too. Another process that is taking place and that we, we are very worried about is the legislative regressions like the bans on single-use plastics, which has already been passed in several countries. In Mexico, many states already have their own prohibitions locally. However, the refreshment industry, the bottle industry is starting trials to fight against the ban on single-use plastics. The most significant case in our country is in the state of Oaxaca, where there is a big number of native peoples who are being impacted by all of this waste. And the Supreme Court of Justice repealed these prohibitions and uh, it set a very negative precedent because new legal actions are being taken to eliminate the bans on single-use plastics in other states. We have seen the need to use more legal actions based on the opinion of the United Nations Rapporteur, Marcos Orellana, who is in charge of the Rapporteurship on Plastic Waste, which establishes that it is the duty of the state to prevent exposure to these plastics, which must be considered as toxic waste. So the limitation on the participation of organizations on in the INC2 in Paris is a reason for concern for us because we believe that these voices must be heard. These topics need to be put on the agenda with other countries so that they halt the import of plastic waste and so that we put limitations so that the legislation is not regressive. Once a certain level of protection of human rights is reached, no steps back should be taken. So this is what's happening. Waste colonialism is being used as an argument, and we consider that it violates the fundamental human rights of those people who live in our region. Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Ms. Indumati and to John. They are after to take us through waste picker rights and just transition. Namaskara, my name is Hindumati and International Waste Picker Alliance Linda Bandidini. Pate uh India India uh Tajas Amika Sanga Anna Sangatne Kadendano Pandidini. Namdu Yen Mukya Wagi uh Guri Hendre just transition anta Naiva the Parivatane Beku Hanta, Yautara Naiva the Parivatane Hanta Handre, uh Ivaga Paper Ayavor Agirbodo, Sangatne Jate Seri, Kelsa Madaur Agirbodo, Paper Dabanta, Collect Madaur Agirbodo, Chichi Kangdi, Kando. Collection ma purchase mada ragir bodu, mate uh door to door collection mada ragir bodu, uh mat uh aggregation central kelsa mada ragir bodu, wo wholesale uh godanal kelsa mada ragir bodu, you gellano waste picker idike birthare, but our gellano just transition anadu, bekanta namaido. On the example ge nanundu darne Yerkana Kishra Patini, just transition under Yautaranta Kelur Kelbodu, Yautaranda Nanundu, Adnan to worship to Munche. And also Tiachitamika Sangha, that is a union of waste pickers in, in India. Why I'm here is to talk about the guest transition and what it means for uh, uh, what it means for us, uh, <clears throat> and uh, 
where what we we say waste pickers who are the waste pickers people who work on the streets and pick up uh, recyclable waste people who do door to door collection people who are having small little um, you know uh, itinerant buyers who go out and buy so it en- encompasses everybody uh, who are in the collection and sorting system so i just want to give you one example of how the just transition can be ಮುಖ್ಯವಾಗಿ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಲ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಫಿಲ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡೋರು ಕೂಡ ನಾನು ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸಿಷನ್ ಅನ್ನೋದು ಬೇಕು ಈ ಏನಿಕೆ ಅಂತ ಅಂತ ಒಂದು ಮುಖ್ಯ ಒಂದು ಚಿಕ್ಕದಾಗಿ ನಾನು ಒಂದು ಉದಾಹರಣೆ ಹೇಳಕ್ ಇಷ್ಟಪಡ್ತೀನಿ ಆ ನಾನು ಹದಿನೆಂಟು ವರ್ಷಕ್ ಮುಂಚೆ ನಾನು ರೋಡ್ ರೋಡ್ ಹೋಗಿ ಚೀಲ ಹಾಕೊಂಡು ಹೋಗಿ ಡಬ್ಬ ಬಾಟ್ಲು ಅದೆಲ್ಲ ಕಾರ್ಡ್ಬೋರ್ಡ್ ಅದೆಲ್ಲ ತಗೊಂಡ್ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೆ ತಗೊಂಬಂದು ಅದನ್ನ ಒಂದು ಮಾರಾಟ ಮಾಡಿ ಹಣದಲ್ಲಿ ನಾನು ಜೀವನ ಮಾಡ್ತಿದ್ದೆ ಇವತ್ತು ನಮ್ಗೆ ಆ ನಮ್ಮ ಹಸಿರು ದಲ ಕಡೆಯಿಂದ ನನ್ಗೆ ಆ ಒಂದು ವೇಸ್ಟ್ ಪಿಕರ್ ಐ ಡಿ ಬಂತು ಆ ಐ ಡಿ ಬಂದ್ಮೇಲೆ ಡೋರ್ ಟು ಡೋರ್ ಕಲೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಕಾರ್ಪೊರೇಷನ್ ಜೊತೆ ಸೇರಿ ಕಾಂಟ್ರಾಕ್ಟ್ ತಗೊಂಡು ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡೋ ತರ ಆಯ್ತು ಇವತ್ತು ಎಂಬತ್ತೆಂಟು ಜನಕ್ಕೆ ನಾನು ಕೆಲಸ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದೀನಿ ಅವ್ರ ಜೊತೆ ಸೇರಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಪ್ರತಿ ಒಂದು ವೇಸ್ಟ್ ಪಿಕರ್ ಅಲ್ಲೂ ಪ್ರತಿ ಒಂದು ಕಂಟ್ರಿ ಅಲ್ಲೂ ಇಂಟರ್ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಲೆವೆಲ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಎಲ್ಲಾರ್ಗು ಆತರ ಒಂದು ಚೇಂಜಸ್ ಅನ್ನೋದು ಬರ್ಬೇಕು ಅನ್ನೋದು ನನ್ನ ಆಸೆ um i want to give an example of my own self when i was uh, 18 years back i started picking up recyclable waste on the street and uh, i would uh, collect it sort it and grade it and sell it and make my living and i i took care of my children and uh, once hasrudala that is our organization came together and we were able to uh, work with the government to get um, occupational identity card and later they gave me opportunity to do door to door collection that was given by the government so today i am able to work with 88 people i won't say i'm just employing them but i because i also work with them 88 of us work and uh, i want the same opportunity for everybody internationally every country every waste picker i want this opportunity um, to become what i am so that is what just transition means for me ಪ್ರತಿ ಒಂದು ವೇಸ್ಟ್ ಪಿಕರ್ ಅಲ್ಲೂ ಇದು ವೇಸ್ಟ್ ಪಿಕರ್ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಎಲ್ಲಾರು ತಿಳ್ಕಂತಾರೆ ಬರೀ ಪೇಪರ್ ಹೈಯರ್ ಮಾತ್ರ ಅಂತ ಬಟ್ ಕಾರ್ಪೊರೇಷನ್ ಜೊತೆಲಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಸೇರಿ ಗವರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಜೊತೆ ಸೇರಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ಬೋದು ಮತ್ತೆ ಅವರು ಒಂಟಿಯಾಗಿ ನಿಂತ್ಕೊಂಡು ಇಂಡಿವಿಜುವಲ್ ಆಗಿನೂ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ಬೋದು ಮತ್ ಸಂಘಟನೆ ಕಡೆ ಸೇರಿ ಮಾಡ್ಬೋದು ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಜಿ ಗ್ರೂಪ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾಡ್ಬೋದು ಇಲ್ಲ ಓನ್ ಅವರೇ ಗ್ರೂಪ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡು ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ಬೋದು ಇದೆಲ್ಲಾನು ಚೇಂಜಸ್ ಅನ್ನೋದನ್ನ ಅದನ್ನ ನ್ಯಾಯವಾದ ಪರಿವರ್ತನೆ ಅನ್ನೋದನ್ನ ನಾನು ಕೇಳ್ಕೊಂತ ಇದೀನಿ when we talk about waste picker working they can work uh, by themselves they can work in um, collectives they can work with uh, uh, different ngos they can work as so, uh, you know um, 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 self help groups that is a collective they can work as cooperative they can work uh, they can form their own group and, and and do it so there are different forms um, in which the waste pickers can work in during this ಧನ್ಯವಾದ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಜಾನ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಮರೀಸಾ ಸೊ ಮೈ ನೇಮ್ ಇಸ್ ಜಾನ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಮೇರೀಸಾ ಮೆನ್ಶನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಬಿಲ್ಡ್ ಅಪ್ ಆನ್ ಸಮ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಮೈ ಕೊಲೀಗ್ ಇಂಡು ಮಾತಿ ಹಾಸ್ ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ಮೆನ್ಶನ್ about just transition which we very much define as ending plastic pollution in a way that is fair and inclusive to all it includes as much as possible to all of the people that work along the value chain and also creating decent work opportunities to waste pickers uh while leaving no one behind uh i would say on just transition that uh i think the world uh has like a very historical debt to waste pickers uh being that we have uh, gained a very broad historic knowledge while doing this work while uh, uh collecting and managing and uh putting uh waste that otherwise would end up to our environment and most particularly plastic that has become a global problem uh west because of uh have been uh, doing like a very tremendous job 
doing this. And uh, I think at this particular point, we, uh, we, we have organized ourselves to define what just transition means to us, because uh, like uh, Indu Matthias has just mentioned that this is something that she started doing when she was 18 years. And we know for sure that the conditions that West speakers work in uh, are not those that are dignified in any way. And we demand uh, some, uh, some sort of uh, dignity to this job that we've been doing. It's a very integral role that we, we've been playing in this value chain. And uh, I would also mention that uh, uh, during this just transition process, we, we, we are trying to find ways in which West speakers are going to uh, uh, also get like social and economic uh, benefits out of the definition and the implementation of just transition. Uh, I think uh, just transition also has to be has to be uh, well funded, and especially during this uh, global treaty process, we are uh, we are putting it in a way that uh, uh, we are demanding a cluster that is supposed to be uh, uh, specifically uh, looking into how the just transition uh, process is going to be implemented, because we know for sure that uh, during such uh, processes. Uh, policies are made and written and back where we work, uh, where our colleagues are, uh, not very much is happening. So because of the situations that we have been exposed to, we are, we are very much driven by uh, this situation and we are very much motivated to make sure that some of the inequalities and uh, the social stigmas that we face are not replicated or are not things that are still continuing. So. We are very much keen on making sure that as uh, we uh, intervene in making these global policies, there's also action that is being uh, like implemented down where we were. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, and Ms. Um, Indomati for the important work that you both are doing. Um, at this moment, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Ahmed Tiamu, um, who is present with us online, to talk to us about the double standards of plastic in the Global South. Are we ready? Um, thank you very much, Marisa. Us, Ahmed. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to uh, be able to share um, some of the experience and, of course, some of the reality um, around the double standard uh, when it comes to the issue of plastic pollution um, in the global south. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ahmed Tiamiu. I work with Community Action Against Plastic Waste. We're primarily based in Nigeria. And of course, we also work in some other communities um, across the Global South. Um, I'd like to quickly speak, first of all, to the challenges around um, the, the export or, or import of um, plastic waste to, 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 the, to Africa and, of course, across the, the rest of the Global South. Um, it, there's a term called waste colonialism. Uh, which is uh, primarily um, what most um, people believe to be a solution, a perfect waste management solution, mostly you see in the global south. Uh, most often what, what happens is basically these waste are being collected, collected and they are shipped um, to, to many developing countries. Um, this is something that is not acceptable and it should not even be happening in the first place. Uh, because for instance, um, in most of these communities where these, um, these waste are being shipped to, they do not even have um, the technology know-how to be able to manage this waste. We see that sometimes even in the issue of um, used clothes or second-hand clothes. 
Many of them are shipped to Africa and shoes, and you know, you see many of uh, plastic, um, um, you know, materials like this. What happened basically is many times when they come to 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 the global south, especially in Africa, in Nigeria, where I come from, for instance, many of them no one even wear them once before they become waste. You see many of these, you know, in, in our community generating, you know, waste and of course creating toxicity. Uh, that is, of course, difficult for our people to manage. And you, you also see issues of, of this also, because what most people believe is that um, the global north has been able to manage their waste perfectly. Uh, because, you know, when, when people see them on TV and those who have the privilege to travel, uh, they see clean streets and, you know, clean neighborhood. And oftentimes they think, oh, okay, so we, this is what we need to copy. But oftentimes, uh, the double standard that many people do are not, uh, you know, do not know. Even sometimes, government officials, policymakers do not know is the fact that many of these waste have been collected. Um, the Sussex is clear, you know, um, in 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 the in America, for instance, in the U.S., only about nine percent of uh, plastic waste are being recycled, and globally, less than nine, uh, 10 percent. So basically, this is they basically ship many of these. Um, uh, waste to to the global south uh, you know in in communities where there's no um machinery or know-how or even skills whatever what you can think about to to manage them um also i'd like to also speak to the issues of um secondly to the issues of chemicals leveling in in plastic production in you see in many global north country in europe specifically um, I learned that in the UK, you could see that many of their plastic are not being properly labeled. Like in the case of those that you can probably use in the microwave, those like you could, um, you know, maybe sometimes even mention the type of material that contained in them. I've even seen recently those those plastic are being labeled. Whether you can use them to store your food in your freezer, um, these are something that things that are obtainable in the global north. But you don't find this in the in 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 in, in the global south. Many of our people are not even aware that many of these plastics that they use are, are being laced with chemicals that are very toxic. Uh, so you see, many time people use them to store food, uh, to store water, um, to use them for all, all kind of things that, of course, that they're exposing them to this chemical, uh, you know, toxic. Uh, and many of them are very toxic. Uh, you know, many of them that are even not allowed to be used in many global um, norms. And as you know, Africa is not a net producer of um, plastic. Uh, basically, many of these are produced around the world, uh, you know, in, in the global north where they, are, they, are, they, they have the technology know-how, where they, they also have, you know, uh, advanced technology to be able to produce many of these and ship them. Even many of them are not allowed to be, you know, used in those countries where they produce them, but they are shipped to Africa and uh, in Asia Pacific um, or across Asia or in the Latin America. And, you know, many people are exposed to this toxicity, um, you know, without knowing. Um, um, lastly, I also to, would like to speak to the issue of just transition, as many colleagues have mentioned as well. You, you see, when these waste are shipped, for for our people to be managed in communities like this many people that work you know waste figures waste work there's no you know living wages there's no um, appropriate work condition many of them don't even have basic ppe to protect themselves you know why you know working in either in recycling facility or sorting this waste but every time they are being exposed to 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 this um, you know toxicity you know by working in conditions like this that they could not even protect themselves they do not even have knowledge like I said before knowledge of some of this toxicity that exists in, in many of this material and because they are, they don't even have you know a proper living wages uh, it, it, they and they work in conditions that nobody wants to work in then no, no, they, there seems to be any kind of protection, you know, but then more, those who ship this waste who are responsible for them, uh, nobody pays for all of this. Uh, this has to stop. These are not acceptable. And these are some of the things that we hope that can, you know, and must actually reflect in, in this uh, treaty to ensure that, you know, workers in, in, in these communities, in many communities that work, they actually get justice. And of course, their work is 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 um is decent, you know. So you know, 
uh, and they are protected from many of the toxins that, that are you know, uh, uh, present in many of in the conditions that work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, so just to reiterate, so far, I think we've heard of some key and important um, demands or important messages from our friends in the global south, such as opposing waste colonialism and waste trade, um, guaranteeing a just transition for waste pickers, and ensuring that they're, uh, they are properly integrated into, um, into the treaty. Um, we've also heard about keeping false solutions out of the treaty. So I'm now going to hand over to Arpita from Asia Pacific, Gaia, who will take us through a few more of the CSO demands that we have for this treaty. Many thanks to Marissa and the entire uh, teams of Africa, Latin America, and Asia Pacific for organizing this very important session. Um, first of all, I am really privileged to be here to be sharing the demands, and a lot of them have already been spoken about, but some which I would like to emphasize for all of you to know. My name is Arpita Bhagat, and I'm from India, working with the Gaia Asia Pacific team. And before we go any further, I think we need to acknowledge that we are all here, and especially I am here because of the work done by leaders in this movement for many, many decades. So um, really recognizing and valuing uh, the shoulders on which I stand, uh, those who are here and those who are not. Um, and just to recap, the Plastic Treaty is a very important occasion, and INC2 specifically so, because this is the first opportunity where the text of the treaty will be discussed. And um, why do we need the treaty? I just want to recap that the need for a treaty really comes from a result of failure of national legislation um, globally, but definitely for Global South, who, because of our lax legislation, have been the recipients of waste from the uh, Global North that, that my friend Anwath has spoken about so well. Um, and I also want to echo in a big way that the just transition demands of waste picker groups that uh, my friend Indumati and John have articulated so beautifully here with the experiences and the narratives that we don't hear about often, but we are seeing more strongly come, uh, come out um, at this occasion. Um, and so clearly, uh, naturally, while countries have been asking for voluntary measures, and there is a, a tiff between voluntary and mandatory control measures, we definitely need an instrument that is prioritizing mandatory control measures because all of the voluntary measures uh, have been around and, and could be around for longer, but do not really uh, help in combating the plastic pollution crisis. And a second point I think that's very important for media folks and everybody to know is that we need a treaty that focuses on the upstream. Of course, we're calling it comprehensive life cycle of plastics uh, approach to be to be tackled, but upstream is really important because if you if you look at legislation across the globe, um, and especially for us uh, in the in the global south, they often look at plastic as a waste problem uh, downstream, which is really problematic because it is uh, fossil fuel and it needs to be tackled as such. Um, so that's the second very important demand that I'm presenting here on behalf of civil society. And, and third and fourth, a few things that we should take in mind um, is, of course, uh, production cuts, like I said, is important. Chemicals transparency. We really need to know what kind of plastics we're consuming, not just what plastic it is uh, in terms of polymers, but definitely what chemicals, and, and it's over 10,000 chemicals we're talking of, which are toxic, and I'm not an expert in, on, on those, but we know that we really need to, um, uh, to, to think about that and to be aware of that as consumers, as people whose health is at stake at this point, and especially the health of waste pickers who deal with this plastic on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and of course, um, when we think about chemicals transparency, you also need to know that we have to go beyond that and really phase out certain toxic chemicals and have a list of both a white list and a black list that civil society is calling out for that is what is allowed and what is not. And it's not just a particular uh, chem chemical, but an entire family, family of chemicals. So it's not just bisphenol A, it's the entire family that needs to be phased out because we know the kind of um, uh, you know, health effects it has uh, on, on human life, but also one of the things that I don't hear very often talked about in the plastic treaty, especially a treaty which says, you know, we have to, we have to deal with pollution, including in the marine environment, the health of the wildlife, the marine wildlife, as well as the animal life on land. Um, so 
just echoing um, the, the concerns shared by uh, Rafael uh, in the beginning, we, we need a strict language against false solutions and not just false solutions like labeled as incineration or waste to energy or, or, or more such like co-processing uh, in semen in kilns from where I come in India, uh, but really we need a language against uh, technology and technocratic solutions. And we need to be very careful about what kind of technocratic solutions are being proposed and pushed by the industry under the garb of um, greenwashing. So that's something that we are very, very um, worried about and careful about. And in that light, um, if you've been following the, car, the climate movement as well, we've had carbon uh, offsetting, carbon okay. credits, and now we're thinking and hearing more about uh, plastic credits and plastic offsets. Uh, plastic neutrality is just showing up in legislation in Asia Pacific, and that really worries us because it is again a, a pass for industry to to continue business as usual and, and get away with what they've been doing for so long. Um, so naturally, um, a related ask is to keep polluters out of the room, out of the negotiations. Um, we know currently uh, that they have a big influence, and we are concerned, and we are trying really hard to fight that. And that's really something to watch out for. So when you hear something, you really need to investigate where it's coming from, and what's the sort of um, uh, how much it is, is it really countering the historical uh, injustices caused on the planet and on the people. Um, and and one of the things I, I, I think it would be remiss if I don't mention is the terms, uh, some of the terms which have been co-opted pretty well. Uh, we're talking about circularity of plastics. So when we think about circularity in itself, it, it is historically, um, you know, the principle of when, when I used to study biology, the, the idea of, you know, there's a natural circling of, of uh, elements that happen, like nitrogen cycle, oxygen cycle, and so on. And we know those cycles have been dis disturbed by climate change. But when you say circularity of plastics for, for, a, for a chemical product, for a toxic product in its essence, what does that really mean, right? How much of it can be done and how much of it is um, uh, pollution is really avoidable? Is, is, is it a question, questionable concept? And it's a que concept that we need to look at more deeply because there is a lot of narratives around um, which are greenwashing. Um, and how much of, uh, of toxicity can you avoid when you say circularity? Including, you know, it's not just plastics of concern like certain plastic, but all plastics that we need to think about. And lastly, um, as as Gaia, we talk about zero waste solutions, the real solutions which are practical, which are possible, which have existed, and especially Asia Pacific and and the Global South really have been known for those, um, uh, which which we used to be using, like like the reuse and refill models that we had until I believe the 1990s, for example, we really need to go back to those because, and we really need to promote those. And um, uh, and it's not about uh, sort of refill, reuse products, but really the systems. So we are calling for system change. We are calling for just transition. We are calling to keep the false greenwash solutions out of the room. And we are calling for uh, respect for human health and human rights and human dignity really um, in this treaty. And, um, I will end here, but thank you for listening. And really, again, once again, uh, very glad to be here. Back to you, Marissa. Thank you so much, Arpita, for sharing with us um, some of the demands that CSOs have for this treaty. Um, I would now like to hand the floor over to um, Alejandra from uh, Latin America, who will talk to us about some of the access issues we as CSOs have been facing on the ground for this process. Hola a todas y todos. Hello everyone. I'm going to speak Spanish. And I'm going to talk about the problems we have had in civil society to have an effective participation in the process of drafting the plastics treaty, especially in this second INC, which is taking place in Paris right now. In this, this time, the hosting country is France, and it offered the UNESCO venue for the development of the negotiations. And this venue has a very limited seating capacity. 
we were given the possibility to register five people per organization. However, only one person per organization will be able to enter the building where the discussions will be held about the text of the treaty. This means that in practice, 80% of those who registered from civil society will be left out of the negotiations, out of the building. We won't even be able to enter the building. This is an enormous restriction. And to this, we must add that the spaces themselves are being occupied by the industry and by the business sector. So the participation of those who are polluting the planet with plastics is considered to be equal to that of the civil society organizations who are in direct contact with the communities that suffer from the impacts of plastic and which defend human rights on the ground and the common good. These two things have a different value. The common good has a superior value over the defense of private and corporate interests. And so when there are space restrictions, priority should be given to the participation of civil society citizens and a strict policy should be implemented to avoid conflicts of interests so that the industry may not participate on an equal footing with citizens and doing this enormous lobby that we know that they are doing so that the treaty will be as ineffective as possible. In addition, additional efforts should be made to allow the participation of the most vulnerable communities and sectors, which are the ones that suffer the most intense impacts of the damage caused by plastic, such as the native peoples, grassroots waste pickers, and other sectors of society whose rights have been violated. Native peoples, indigenous peoples have practically no participation spaces. They are requested to co-host side events as, and uh, the same happened to the organizations from Latin America, but we were not given the opportunity to co-host any side event in this second INC. This is something that has to be solved for the third INC. We cannot accept as a normal issue for citizens to be left out of the discussions. On the contrary, participation, actual participation spaces need to be enlarged for the actual influence of the associations of citizens who are in direct contact with those communities at the front line of plastic pollution. Thank you. those very important concerns for all of us. Um, we appreciate it. So we have now come to the end of our briefing and I would like to now invite um, our media personnel who are with us here today um, to share any questions you may have for our panelists at this point. Over to you. So I think something everybody touched on, I'd like to put out something maybe to be just looked at in general. It's a question of human rights. It seems very fundamental to have about human rights. It's very interesting because I think that in um, countries producing more of the plastic, actually we speak less in terms of human rights and what is out of waste and pollution. And it was very interesting to me to note that, that narrative uh, switch. Um, something that occurs to me very strongly is that if the treaty is adopted in the way it seems to be adopted, it's going to mean that dealing with waste is going to be a growing industry for a certain amount of time, and then it's going to be a declining industry as well. Um, how do you see the future of waste collectors' rights and 
working conditions within your countries? And is it something that the treaty can take into account? Mm -hmm. We can't hear the presenter, we can't hear Alejandra. Something seems to be wrong with the microphone. There is no sound. If they, if they could, if someone could unmute that microphone, please. We have less possibilities of enjoying our human rights with this plastic moving around the environment. So human rights are equal to all for everyone, whether we live in the north, in the global north or the global south, everyone should be able to enjoy a healthy environment, the right to health, the right to proper nutrition, the right to information should be equal to all. However, these rights cannot be enjoyed or exercised by many. However, more particularly those that live in communities of the global south, the most vulnerable one, those that are part of the indigenous communities where these dump sites are located, where we see plastic together with the rest of the waste. So, in other words, this allows us to see that if we cannot exercise the same benefits, enjoy the same rights, and those are just applicable to some and not to all, then these benefits should not exist for anyone. We should all have the same human rights and we should all be able to exercise and enjoy them. That is the focus that we are demanding for the drafting of this treaty. And to supplement what Alejandra just said, not only do we want these human rights focus, but also a fair and environmental justice focus so that we can see inequalities. All regions can exercise human rights. The focus of environmental justice allows us to see these inequalities existent in the regions. We need to stress that the whole cycle of plastic vulnerates and violates human rights, trade, production, transport, until it becomes plastic waste. And this is very well analyzed and described in the report by the UN Rapporteur, Dr. Marcos Orellana, which I suggest you to read, it is on the page of the Rapporteur in many languages. Thank you. Okay, so we just have one more um, response from our folks in person. Uh, I think the question uh, like uh, basically also outlines the uh, concept of thinking uh, on a global platform, but also taking back the action to uh, where we work uh, locally. Uh, but then again, uh, building up on the question, this is uh, something that I would say that we've been very much uh, from a local perspective been pushing 
so that we speakers also start taking a role so owing to the fact that we all we already have those historic knowledge that we've built on we 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 we've been pushing so that West speakers start taking the roles of waste management through the local governments and also this reflects more onto also the national because uh, like in such a policy making process it's the national delegates that are all, always like sent here so uh, I, I guess this is one of the uh, one of the things that as we proceed uh, I would also say that uh, this treaty negotiation has to also like center the voices and build on the expertise and uh, and the historic knowledge that uh, we have we have been acquiring. Thank you. You will let Fraction Kelly, either on the Parastati Nale Barute and Tanenabo. Uh, Parivatane and Adana Kelta Divi, Mate of Asuru Udiavum Golo, Mate Asuru Harti Kate Henta, Maname training Beka Godo, Mate time with Godo, Adana La Mate Muduke, Tara de Kenta, Adukus Rani Vaganavu, Naiva the Parivatane Kelta. And he has a collecting the human rights to waste uh, and our role. What we are talking about now is we want to. Uh, be part of green economy and uh, green skills are something that we need to acquire and get trained to um, and move to a more sustainable businesses uh, that will uh, provide space within what we are talking about. I think this is a very, very important question and one that we will have to answer more often than we imagine. Um, I think what's important, because it's it's very connected to implementation, when you think about it in the long run, I think one thing we need to look out for, which right now, because it's just the starting, we're focusing a lot on getting the objectives and the control measures right. But one of the things that we have to think about is the financial mechanism and how it will show up and where the money goes, because the money has to come for the global South countries in a in a big way. Uh, there are different proposals, the likes of uh, different organizations are suggesting what is the best way. Uh, and when the money comes in, it needs to go to civil society who are looking at solutions um, and bottom lining it, uh, but definitely to the, to, to the affected communities like Indumati was saying for their training capacity building, provide them with the resources, uh, including uh, workers across the life cycle, also informal businesses, also informal sector who uh, would not get the resources directly because they probably are not recognized a lot of the countries, uh, just their existence. So that's something to think about as well. Thank you. Hey, um, I think there may also be a question. Okay, if, if we can just take one from online and then, sure, thank you. I think we may have a question from from someone online, um, just gonna. Okay, we just have one more question um, from our media person on the floor. Um, would you like to go ahead and I can just interpret back to our online audience? Um, 
that question. Uh, first is, uh, in which countries do you see, uh, you know, the biggest part of the country's activity? So the policies, um, you know, the challenge of those are the communities, uh, and also are the increasing implementation. Um, so, you know, the benefits. And then uh, the second part is not actually just going to run on the regional sector. The best part is, you know, we're talking about it, and that's what's very responsible for the region. So, we're talking about the side of this. And so, one of the reasons that our regional sector is not as good is because we have a regional push back or we have a regional sector. So, the best thing I would say is that this relevance is relevant, you know, the knowledge and the Okay, um, so for our um, participants online, uh, the question from the floor has been, uh, which countries, so it's based on trade, which countries are actually um, strong on their policies um, in the global south on trade? And then the second part of the question is uh, based on coming from a, um, uh, our, our colleague here has come from a trade, um, a trade side event where they mentioned that uh, trade is, um, is, is an important part of the GDP um, in the global south. And that is a question that has been posed to our panelists and they will now take the floor and answer that. Thank you for the question. Uh, bueno, in nuestra investigación, in our research, we have not really reached that analysis capacity on measures being implemented at a regional level. However, what we detected is that in those countries such as Ecuador, Argentina, Mexico, and there's one more, there are no measures to stop this. What we do have is the Basel Convention that in 2021 started applying the plastic amendment. So that means that plastic waste is within that regulation. What we have to do and we are doing is to foster, to push these countries to comply with this plastic amendment so that local national legislations can be modified to comply with this plastic amendment of the Basel Convention. Alejandra, do you want to add anything? Thank you. everyone for joining us um, for those that joined us online and for those that joined us in person um, that is uh, a wrap for uh, our session today um, and we just like to extend our appreciation to all of you for joining us and engaging with us thank you thank you